Welcome to another round of Salty Takeaways. Not necessarily bitter ends, uh, considering what we were looking at on Twitter with everybody after the 1-1 draw in Cincinnati. And looking at the juice boxes, once again, the largest number on the board was the one that ended up with uh, the winning side. I forget, Jarrett, which uh, match of ours is the next one up when it comes to our, I think it's a seven pack this week, but Looking at the uh, the results from juice boxes, it was a plus 248 for the draw, where FC Cincinnati was a plus 118, Atlanta United a plus 227. FC Cincinnati still has not won a home match in their last 20-plus. So, Jarrett, uh, opening statement from the match for FC Cincinnati and Atlanta United. Oh, where to begin? Um, <laughs> it, man. It's it's just exhausting all of the draws that Atlanta United has put together. You're getting to the point where it's it's good not to drop points, but you get to the point you're going to have to start stealing points because you've had points that you've given away. Um, last night, though, I mean, if you want to take positives out of it, you can absolutely do that because you looked kind of flat at the beginning playing a Cincinnati team. But I'm going to digress and say Cincinnati's really obnoxious to play against and to watch because they're just mind-numbingly inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Um, Cincinnati can show up like they did last night, where they played fairly well. They played well until Yapstam got scared and flinched in the last 25 minutes. Um, but they played really well, and it was night and day from the team that went to Montreal and just got like, just get run over. It was 5-4 to Montreal in a game where they're scoring at will, but they can't stop anybody. Uh, and Vermeer just goes from goes from being a nightmare goalkeeper. He turns into who God was this Kenneth minutes. Vermeer that we saw last night? It, Cincinnati is so inconsistent. And the problem with inconsistent teams is you get games like this sometimes where uh, somebody for their team will show up and just like, oh, I didn't know he could do that. Son of a gun. And then you will all learn together that, oh. They have that in them. They just can't harness it. And you just kind of, sometimes you just catch the misfortune of being the team that catches them on the good day. But ultimately, you know, Atlanta goes in. They kind of start a little slow. Alec Cam comes up with saves when he needs to, to keep you in things. And Atlanta grows into the game. And by the end of it, you know, you're looking at it. It's really easy, I think, to forget the the saves Can had at the beginning of the game when you look at the grand scheme of things and say, well, Kenneth Vermeer is out there keeping Atlanta from scoring three goals at the end of the game. Both keepers stood up and did what they had to do. And it was a fun game to watch. Even though it ended 1-1, you created chances. I think you had 22 shots on goal, which Cincinnati can kind of leak shots anyway, Mm -hmm. which is stunning because we thought Yop Stom was going to come in here and have Cincinnati actually playing defense like they get forward just fine like they, they're they not great defensively at all no they're, i mean they invite you to shoot from 20 yards and atlanta was more than happy to do it um Lissetto pulled the trigger and damn near won the game with a galasso um you forced kenneth vermeer to have to make shots and more importantly i give him credit it wasn't just the shot stopping on some of the long ones. It did a good job of corralling them and not giving up the rebound because uh, Conway and later Joseph were looking for those rebounds and guys coming barreling in. Uh, Conway's going to feel like he had a couple opportunities he missed in the first half, which is understandable. But I thought the first half Cincinnati was a little bit better. Maybe not as much. Like I know Can had to make the saves. Atlanta also just flat out missed a couple of opportunities. Uh you have Conway headed over far, Mulraney with his diving header just barely on the wrong side of the post. Um, I don't think it was as one side in the first half as maybe people think it was. That's just my opinion. And the second half, I mean, Cincinnati gets the goal because Luciano Costa is his eternal goal is to torment Atlanta. But yeah. then you get a goal and then you just you 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 lean on them so hard that Yapstam gets shook and you know, drops into uh, drops into like a five man back line. It's like we just got to get out of here with a point. Couple of things out of the blocks. Jackson Conway got the start up top uh, last night. Ronald Hernandez got the start at left back last night. And you mentioned 
the the early chance you had the early chance with uh, Jackson Conway in the third and it was uh, you know Mulraney with a shot and it was punched out to Conway and Conway uh, missed the the follow up there and one of the other folks that I wanted to get into at least in the early part of the discussion as we look at the first 45 minutes Marcelina Moreno who last night on sofa score punched an 8.6 on sofa score last night I, I think that Marcelina Moreno had to have cloned himself before he ended up in, in Cincinnati on you know the midweek because it seemed like he was everywhere last night. It's like everywhere you turn, Marcelina Moreno was getting mentioned for either being a, the straw in stirring an offensive run or a possession deep in the attacking third, backtracking defensively. Marcelina Moreno was everywhere last night. Arsenio Moreno was the best player on the field, and it wasn't really close last night. Um, he just basically tore Cincinnati open over and over and over again, and it was hilarious. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. He cleared, created a ton of chances, um, almost won the game at the end, then like just went through like a frolicking skip through the box with like 20 seconds left in stoppage time. Uh, creates a corner that, you know, you kind of hoped would something magical would happen, but Marcelino Moreno has been really good. And I, I'll maintain that he's been really good. I think last night, the difference was he was really good. And those chances were much more obvious. It was, you know, him playing in Jackson Conway in a shot that Conway is going to want back. Um, you know, him making, you know, connecting passes and little interplay that was, very good that was creating huge chances. I was just over the moon with Marcelino Moreno, and that's the guy that I th- I feel like me. That's the guy that people saw last year when he came in in the middle of the 2020 season, and people were really excited about him for this season. It's because that player you saw last night is the one they remember, and I think he's been here, but I think that one was – you looked at it and was like, oh, that's obviously that guy. And the the pressure for Atlanta United creating chances. Uh, you had uh, Barrial fouling Marcelino, Marcelino Moreno. There was the shot off the bar off the set piece where Vermeer was beaten. And this is all in the first 10 minutes. And then, you know, a, as you mentioned, the, the ebb and flow of that first 45, it looked like the first 10 was Atlanta United. That second 10 was for FC Cincinnati because then you had Brenner, you had Barrial. And we mentioned Marcelino Moreno, who was uh, backtracking on that particular play. And, and I think that, you know, Atlanta United saw something going up against Jeff Cameron at the back. And, and I think that when you saw uh, the lineup come out and Cameron was back there, I don't know how many times I wrote down that, you know, Vermeer was confused with communication with Jeff Cameron, Jeff Cameron beaten, Jeff Cameron this, Jeff Cameron that. I think that they selected <laughs> Jeff Cameron for picking. And that was one of the weak spots at the back for FC Cincinnati last night. I thought so, too, at times. Um, he did some good work. Um, but at the, at the same time, like, he, the Atlanta was going after him. Um, my favorite part was, Jack, was uh, him go, uh, Jackson Conway going in and trying to, like, you know, remove his ankles. And then he gets up and wants to fight Jackson. I was like, okay, cool, man. Hey, kid, go in there and fight him. Um, <laughs> can't back down. Go fight him. See what happens. It was, um, it was, it, it's, it's one of those interesting things. I feel like a lot of times when we bring in these defenders from all over the world, like, oh, you're bringing in somebody to get beat. I kind of feel like that's what's happening more often than not. It, you also had, you know, we, we mentioned the, the big moments for Alec Can, and a lot of them were centered around uh, the, the Strasbourg uh, acting school the graduate, uh, Luciano Acosta, and we'll get into Acosta. And, and a lot of folks on the timeline who uh, had their thoughts, uh, as the, and they were pretty salty toward Luciano Acosta, and he, he drove uh, Atlanta United fans crazy with his time at D.C. United, continued to do so, and, and we'll get into the uh, the acting in just a bit. But obviously, big saves for Alec Can in the 24th, in, in the 28th, and then there was the uh, opportunity that FC Cincinnati had in the 30th where – uh, Hernandez has called for a foul on Joe Jow. And if you read Hernandez's lips, he says, I didn't touch him. I didn't think he did. It created a set piece for FC Cincinnati. 
but it didn't uh, get into anything. But it's you know you're you're seeing the the bit of the dark arts happen early, and it was fairly consistent from the FC Cincinnati side. Yeah, it was uh, the thing with Joe Jow is I feel like um, I brought this up last night. Like Joe Jow is a sneaky, annoying matchup to have to deal with. He's very talented. He's very fast. Um, and that is that he's quick over like 20 meters. He's kind of a problem in that respect. And I think, you know, it was, it was a tough ask for Hernandez to deal with Joe Jow. And in the first half, he kind of struggled with him. And he found his footing in the second half. You know, I, I could not tell at that angle if he caught him or not. I uh, know Hernandez was very adamant that he didn't. Um, but, eh, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you survived on that front. That and, is true. Yeah, it's it's a tough matchup. Joe Jow is kind of, he, he's kind of against. And then Acosta, like, look, Acosta is a wonderful heel. And this league needs heels. Um you know, whether that's, like, the bl- the absolutely blatant, like, flopping to try and get somebody sent off, and then two minutes later scoring a, you know, a, a fantastic goal. Like, he's, he's a great heel. Um, I feel like he is one of those guys, though, that when he's on your team, you're all about it. If he's mm-hmm. not on your team, you want to kick him across the field. Yes, I think that's, I think that's accurate. It's almost like the, uh, the hockey goon where – if uh, like a Sean Avery type where if he's on your team, you love him. But the second that he's on another team or, you know, the second that he's with somebody else, it he absolutely drives you crazy. Goal is at the break. Do some of your first half numbers. Atlanta possession up 54, 46 total shots. Uh, FC Cincinnati had 10 to eight shots on target for three, three blocks for FC Cincinnati. They also had three to two in corners. Uh, big chances, though, in the first 45 were all on Atlanta United's side when it came to the advantages. Uh, two to one in big chances. You hit the woodwork early. Uh, one counterattack and a shot off of that counterattack. Uh, passes 236 to 203. Accurate passes 82% to 79%. Long balls 20 of 38 in long balls for a 53%. And then four of 11 on cross is only two of seven for FC Cincinnati. FC Cincinnati on the dribble, 12 of 19, as opposed to five of nine. And uh, 76 possessions lost for FCC as opposed to 70. Atlanta United in the first 45 won 33 of 56 duels. And Aerials won 11 to two. And I thought that that was interesting, as well as tackles 11, five, six picks to one. And that forced eight clearances for FC Cincinnati. So you see a lot of the the blue dominating in that first 45, even though it was goalless. Yeah, you, you saw them really kind of try and grab control of it. They pressed. Uh, I know. I know. Alec Can gave a lot of people an ulcer mm-hmm. um, playing with the ball at his feet. At literally the last second, like getting the ball off as late as humanly possible. Um, hey, y'all. Uh, I don't know if y'all seen Alec Can at the twos. Alec Can's a better player than he was in 2017. He's much better with the ball at his feet. He's much more calm. I know last night he was maybe a little too calm for some people. He's still <laughs> a really good shot stopper. And yeah, Alec Can's really good. Go to Kennesaw and watch him whenever you don't have uh, Rocco Rios Novo in goal. Um, Can's been getting some starts up there. Ben Lungard. I mean, you've seen a mixture of guys. And Alec Can really, I think, has stepped up and become a more complete goalkeeper and you saw that because you you see it in terms of how calm he is with the ball to speed i know it killed people last night um but also yeah he's still an outstanding shot stopper so great job by him to kind of help weather that storm and yeah you're you're getting pressed by cincinnati and you're gonna try you're trying to play through it and then cincinnati occasionally was giving you gifts like they're trying to skip lines with, by trying to pass through lines and just wildly inaccurate passing that was like <laughs> like right to like it would be like somebody trying to break a line and oh man this is gonna be a 30 yard ball to up oh, it's right to a Mercedes and then say it's just gonna counter mm-hmm. like that's yeah that's not a that's not a good idea y'all um and yeah Cincinnati's got some things they gotta work on Atlanta does too um you created plenty of chances, but you you, you got to put them in the back of the net. And both of them are going to feel like they didn't put enough of their chances back in the net. Second half, it looked like somebody pulled the uh, the golf tee out of the governor in the golf cart, at least in, in the first little while, where 
you had a shot from distance where Vermeer had to come up big again in the 50th. Machop Chol had a, a, a shot that was wide. Uh, Barial in the fi- in the next minute was, uh, you know, that was the, I think that was the one where it hit the post. Then it hit Alec Can on the way back out and then it trickled wide of the net that almost gave Cincinnati their first goal on the board. And then uh, I was the one after that was where it was a corner and then Madunian in hits a shot. It was saved, created another corner as well. So you had that bit of chaos there from, say, 50 to 65, where Atlanta United once again would get out of the blocks you know, pretty decently in the early part of the second half, then FC Cincinnati would come back and they would get momentum. And then the the moment I think that a lot of folks, at least in our, uh, you know, in our timeline, were the most salty about was uh, the Luciano Acosta acting school where he tried to draw a, a card for uh, a whiff. And I think it was Santi Sosa who he was kind of jostling with and then Acosta absolutely goes down on zero contact whatsoever. And I know a lot of folks were wondering, well, why can't you give him a yellow for simulation in a situation like that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess no <laughs> way. I don't, I don't think anybody saw it. Like they saw it up like, oh, he didn't hit him in the face, but they just kind of let it go Yeah, and didn't bother with it after that. But yeah, I can understand the frustration with it. The annoying part to me was him going to the side because he has to come off because he had the trainers come on. He's sitting there yelling at Baltimore Toledo, the fourth official. Like, dude, what the hell are you yelling about? You tried to you tried to cheap out and earn something and it didn't work. Let it go, man. Like, yeah, you 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 tried to you tried to steal a you tried to steal a um you tried to steal a card or maybe a sending off and it didn't work. Don't go yelling at the fourth official because they didn't buy your acting job. But yeah, then he comes on like moments later and scores a wonderful goal good ball in from brenner who was kind of i thought kind of quiet on the night overall yeah but then that's a really good ball in and it just it's one of those is just it gets loose in the box and you just feel like and acosta's like three feet tall dude's gonna get on the end of it and then he's and so he and his imagination i mean we saw moments where luciano acosta's imagination that we'd seen in the past with his time with dc where he's trying to pull off some absolutely ridiculous things out of his imagination, and a lot of times they almost came to fruition with what he was thinking through in, in that Matrix-like brain of his. Yeah, I mean, he's he he's very creative. He's very talented. It's one of those things, like I said, he's that guy that if he's on your team, you love him. If he's not on your team, you want to kick him. Just how he is, because he's very good. And then you just get frustrated when he does like the theatrical stuff that for no good reason. And then he comes back and he'll score a great goal or he'll create chances. I mean, Luciano Costa is a really good player. 65th minute, I think, was the moment that a lot of folks also were looking forward to seeing Joseph Martinez coming back on for uh, Jackson Conway. Hasechu comes in for the first time in a long time for a Mercedes. And then uh, once again, Alec Can gets called on a on another big save, this time on Brenner a couple of minutes in. But five minutes after the sub, you get uh, Brooks Lennon with a tremendous run. Tell me if you've heard that sentence before. Then uh, sends it in, and uh, Machop Cho kind of brushes it backwards, a bit of a back heel to Hernandez. And Hernandez with the goal to make it 1-1 one, one with 20 minutes to go. I remain unconvinced that Machop Cho didn't whiff on that shot. I need to see it again. Um, and that's fine. If he did, it worked out nicely. Um, the whole thing starts with Jake Mulraney. Uh, spinning off and turning a defender about three different ways to Sunday. Uh, it's a great move for Mulraney to find space. Then, you know, the little interplay with Lennon that gets Lennon free down the right side. Lennon, like, gets that little channel, not down the sideline, but just at the edge of the 18 and just, like, sprints in. There's nobody there. Uh, cuts it back. Joseph takes, like, three defenders with him. Joel's a little bit behind him. He's either back healing it or, or trying to snapshot it, and it doesn't go. And then, yeah. Hernandez cleans it up, and it's not unlike the goal that uh, Bronco Escobar scores in the playoffs in 2019. It's, it's you know, this ball that's just kind of lumbering through the box. And then the uh, then you get a situation where, you know, the, 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 the fullback just comes flying in, screaming, and another thing, as he <laughs> fires it in. And then from there, yeah, from there, Atlanta decided, 
Well, might as well go win the damn thing. And then Yop Stom, with 11 minutes to go, brings in Nick Hagland for Barial. And uh, I think we pretty much figured what Yop Stom was thinking at that point. But then, you know, you'd mentioned Hasechu, who basically a minute into the substitution for Hagland that was that went defensive, Vermeer had to get called again for another one. Uh, Sosa in the 84th was from long range trying to check uh, and see if uh, Vermeer was still paying attention. You had a set piece where with Joseph in the 86th, where I think a lot of folks were thinking, OK, this is this is how your storybook's going to end. Joseph puts it in the back of the net. Vermeer had to come up big with it with a save there. And then uh, you had mentioned Mulraney and Moreno with uh, Vermeer with a save at 90 plus one. Then Joseph and Moreno with the corner one one draw was your final. And looking at the final numbers, once again, courtesy of our friends at Sofa Score, Atlanta United uh, has the possession 56 44, 22 total shots, nine on target, uh, six blocks, 12 corners. And I think Mike Conti said uh, on his Twitter that 10 of those corners came in the second half. Uh, big chances, once again, for Atlanta United 3 1 counterattacks. They were credited with one uh, counterattack, 12 shots inside the box, passes. Uh, 465 to 378, passing at an 84% clip. Long balls at more than 50%, 34 of 64. Uh, completed six of their crosses on the night, six to two in crosses for uh, Atlanta United. Uh, the duels, 57 46 for Atlanta United. And the, once again, the aerials, 17 of 27 for Atlanta United. Also, 18 tackles to 11 and nine interceptions to four, which meant that FC Cincinnati had to clear 21 chances on the night for Atlanta United. Some of the uh, numbers, courtesy of our friends at SofaScore, uh, Jake Mulraney at a 7.4. We mentioned Moreno at an 8.6. Machope Chol, who uh, you know had a very quiet night, punched a 6.9. Sosa had a 7. Sadich had a 6.6. Brooks Lennon, not a surprise, at a 7.5. Alan Franco at the back with a 7. Uh, Anton Walks, uh, the 6.3, obviously, uh, with uh, the goal that was scored. Hernandez at a 7.8. Alec Can at a 7.6. On the night, Atlanta United at a 7.09, according to SofaScore, versus a 6.93 for FC Cincinnati. And so it's another point on the board. Uh, Jarrett, let's get into what some of the comments were from some of the folks that were uh, watching the match along with us. Bartimus Prime, Bart Keeler comes in. He says, always take a point on the road in MLS. It just feels like Vermeer stole three from us. That's how I feel like. It feels to me like Vermeer stole points from you, and that stinks. Um, also, it kind of felt like the old days of, oh, what's this? Atlanta found a goalkeeper who's going to have an absolute world-class night against you? Sounds about right. Mm -hmm. Just kind of what happens sometimes. Um, it sucks. You're never really okay with it. But it just kind of happens. Um, and you just got to keep putting shots on frame and which they did. I mean, it wasn't like they were shooting it right at him. You know, the, sh the save he makes on Hasetu is absolutely absurd. Uh, he reads Joseph sh uh, shot on the free kick late and just gets a hand to it. Like he made good saves. You just keep shooting it at places that you hope he can't reach. And as annoying as that sounds, that's kind of what you're limited to sometimes. Andrew Bucciolato at A2 Booch says, when you don't finish, no one wins. Yeah, I mean, he did everything you could to finish, I think. Um, you, you were putting shot. It wasn't like you were hitting ground balls right to his feet where it was like, oh, we had 10 shots on goals. Okay, but yeah, it, it wasn't like that. It, was, it, it wasn't like you were like hitting little ground balls to him where, you know, well, we put 10 shots on goal, but they were all little ground balls. Like, no, you put some really good shots on. Um, you got to, you want to play a more complete game though because the first half, it wasn't as good. So you want to try and carry momentum and not get uh, and not get kind of you know run at for the first 45 if you can help it. But yeah, you gotta you're gonna have something you're gonna have to build on because Columbus is not a pushover by any means. They will cause you problems. Caleb Cook with the uh, replay of Luciano Acosta with what we were discussing about. Uh, uh, Lucho and uh, the simulation of contact. Caleb Cook, and this is a two-step. Caleb Cook says, it's this is shameful. It's the worst part of our game. There should be suspensions for stuff like this. I can't imagine my kids seeing me do something like that. Ropes directly to pro 
with his salty takeaway says, at Pro Referees, is this simulation what you approve of? Hey, you hey, you know what? You don't know what you're going to get asking Pro, because last time Atlanta drew up in Nashville, Pro stepped in and completely screwed up what was going to be a beautifully fun game to end because they don't know how to make calls and they don't know how to hold each other accountable. So asking Pro's opinion on this is kind of pointless. All Pro has been doing is getting stuff extremely wrong and then very quietly whispering that they got stuff wrong after the fact, after it impacts games heavily. So, yeah, I have zero faith that Pro's going to get it right. And you ain't the only one. I, I think a lot of times pro whispers because they got caught, you know, and they're having the inside the bar studio where they're kind of showing things and then they'll 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 take the information and they'll take their analysis and they'll kind of push it to page six as a part of the discussion more than anything else and just hope that the discussion goes away if they acknowledge it and acknowledge it quickly. There, the thing that really gets me about him is like it, you uh, pro i don't know how else to explain this to you other than to say you make it really easy for a conspiracy theorists to say you, that you care more about making your buddies look good than you care about getting calls right david at who took my thrash he says let's get salty goalkeeping on both sides were key morena was dangerous chole had a rough night better offensive play centrally new attacking plan or bad Cincy defense? Can was very good. I think it was a little bit of both. Like Cincinnati is not was not great defensively. Um, at the same time, like yeah, Cincinnati. Cincinnati's not great defensively. Atlanta played with a spark in the second half. I was impressed with that part. I mean, like they they came out there ready to go. Um, there's, there's a little column A, a little column B. Can steps out. Uh, Vermeer makes some saves. Cincinnati's not great defensively. Like, it can be a little bit of everything. That, that, I don't think it has to be one thing or another. But, yeah, you can point to all of it. Um, yeah, yeah, some of it is – there's a reason Cincinnati's where they are on the table at the sure. end of the day. No They're doubt. not – like, Cincinnati is still trying to figure out who the actual hell they are. Yes. And sometimes they are an actual hell. Just ask their fans when it comes to what they're seeing out there on the pitch. Yeah. Turner Kirby, seeing a lot of, quote, why is Gazan playing over can, end quote, on my timeline. Guz has shown nothing that would cost him his starting job except rusting on the bench with the USMNT. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, but you're going to take him as a third keeper. I'm, I am I get it in that respect because I, I remember feeling that way during the fabled 2017 Minnesota home game where Kyle Rainish and uh, Alex Tembakis has to step in. Yes. Uh, because Can because Can was hurt. Um, you started Rainish, and then you ended up going to Tembakis because Rainish gets sent off. Yes. Uh, all because Guzan sitting on the bench going into the World Cup. And during that stretch, that was like the very tail end of the Tim Howard era where Howard like was not quick enough to read those long shots anymore. And Guzan was actually in a really good run of form. And I remember thinking like, you just start Guzan in, you know, you, you should consider starting Guzan in Trinidad for the, for the, the game we will not talk about. No. And instead Guzan sat on the bench and just kind of, you know, rusted yes. there. Thanks. So, yeah. Thanks. That was Bruce, though. That's, yes. That's not Greg's fault. Thanks. Insert coach fault. here. Also on the board. Uh, let's see. Patrick Delaney. He says the team played a lot more loose and direct, which was both entertaining and stressful. Yes. Would this style work against tougher opponents or was this just uh, what the game called for? Did you see any other tactical tweaks? Hashtag overreaction. What day is it? Uh, I don't know. Don't it's it Thursday, according to the legal pad of doom. So that's what I'm going off of. OK, cool. We'll just go with that then. Um, I think they're going to stick with what they know and they're going to they're going to play the game that they want to be comfortable playing. And we'll see how that shapes out against Columbus Saturday. Cause I mean, they might have to change how they do things again. Columbus isn't a great team. They're wildly inconsistent teams. The problem with inconsistent teams is occasionally you catch an inconsistent team on a good night on a different night. Atlanta might go up there and drop four on them, but it didn't happen. They actually, Cincinnati played pretty well last night until Yopstam got scared and put them in a turtle, turtle shell, but you kind of had to, cause he was getting overrun in the midfield. 
couple of thoughts on uh, Luciano Acosta. Uh, Abby says that he should get an acting award. Uh, Ella Bell says that uh, she's hoping that he'll get a nice simulation fine from MLS. And Five Takes says, bruh, get on the dive team. Uh, like I said, he's the guy, if he's not on your team, you want to fight him. If he's on your team, you're going to love him because he's going to create so many things. And he's so damn creative with even stuff that doesn't come off. You're like, oh, that'd be beautiful if it happened. And then uh, last one on the board once again goes back between the sticks. Griffin Westbrook says, uh, Alec can 115,000 greater than Gazan at 805,000. Seems like this just makes sense financially. And because of how can has been playing, he's also six years younger. Say we do move on from Gazan and we have that 700,000. How do y'all think it would get reinvested? Uh, I, I think we're a couple of years away from that. I think uh, what Brad's under contract for another two years. If yeah, I think he signed sure. an extension through 23 like a year or two ago. And, and we're still a little ways away from that. And, and you know, the roster was built in this way for situations like this. And, and when you look at what Atlanta United has in the queue, uh, you, you're looking at you're looking at Alec Can, you're looking at Ben Lungard, you're looking at Rocco Rios Novo, you're looking at, at uh, Vicente Reyes, you're looking at Justin Garces. So I think that the the goalkeeper pipeline is is pretty good when it comes to the future but honestly it's just going to come down to need at that particular time with that that money that you would have on hand i mean it's not i don't think it's necessarily something that you can sit there and pin down immediately and go well let's spend it on x it, it literally is going to be at the time that you think that you need to move on, say, two years from now at the end of the contract. It probably won't be at keeper, but it's going to be on, you know, it's, is it, which line is it going to be? Is it going to be in attack? Is it going to be in the midfield? Is it going to be on defense? I think literally it's going to come at, come at you. When that moment comes, you're going to look at your roster and figure out how it will best suit you then. I don't think this is a decision that you can sit here and analyze right now because I still think we're a couple of seasons away from it. Yeah, you're not cutting Brad Guzan loose right now, I don't think. But, I mean, I think this is he's, – he's in his last contract. Um, he's earned his last – you know, I don't know if you're going to renew him after this. Right, yeah. I think he's in his last cycle when it comes yeah. to a contract. Because I think, you know, you're going to be in your, your late 30s at the time that this contract is up. And, yes, we have seen internationally keepers on the north end of 40 who are still at the top of their game, you know, see Buffon Coma Gigi. And Casey Kell and uh, Brad Friedel, you know, was someone who was still active in his early 40s when it came to to being keeper. But it's just it's literally when that moment comes, you know, that you're, you're going to be looking at it probably a year away. So you're probably a year away and looking at, OK, what's the age and the health of uh, the position players and things like that. So, Griffin, I don't think it will be in net just because of the depth that you have. It's going to be a, a field position when it comes to what you're looking at for those kinds of replacements. Uh, any other thoughts from you, sir, as we get ready for the weekend? Quick turn where uh, Atlanta United hosts Columbus. And right now, Saturday, 3.30, juice box is on the board. Atlanta's a plus 119. Your draw is a plus 227. And Columbus crew is a plus 239, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. Ooh. I'm surprised that number is that way. I mean, Columbus is having trouble putting goals in the back of it. I know everyone swooned over the Darlington Nagby goal this week. Right. It yes. was a wonderful goal. You should yes. swoon over it. It was amazing. Um, but they've had trouble scoring. You know, they don't have Jossie Zardes right now. Like, they might decide, hey, we're going to come in here. We're going to sit back and do, honestly, what they did in 2019. I think it was. Like, they came in here and they were like, hey, yeah, we're um, – we're going to sit back and we're going to take our counters. They beat Atlanta like three, nothing that day. Um, I think, I think you might end up with that where they're just decide, Hey, we're going to sit back. We're going to counter you. And we're going to just, um, yeah, we're not in any hurry here because we'll find something on the counter because we've got good skill players. But yeah, that's, I guess that explains that number. Um, Atlanta needs three points though. Yes. Like it's great that you got a point on the road. You're to the point now where, 
you would really have loved to have steal, stolen all three points on the road last night because you need to start stealing points because you've been giving away points. you got to get them back. You need all three points against Columbus. You need a win. If for no other reason, you're on such a long, winless streak. Yeah. Um, but also, you need a win just to – I know you have two-thirds of the season left. Just – you got to get a win at some point. Like, you got to, like, get – for your own personal psyche and makeup, I think you need to 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 show to yourself that you can get a win in a situation where you're not having to scramble for a point falling behind, whether it's on the road or at home. That for your own personal, you know, for your own satisfaction as a club, you can sit and say, okay, yes, we can win games. Yes. And you got to go do that. So we'll see how they do that against a Columbus team. It's going to be tough. Like Columbus is not going to be a pushover, so we'll have to see how it goes. But oh well, I don't know. We'll we'll just we'll see. Um, it's going to be a tough game, but if you can pick up three points against Columbus, I think that's a big boost. And then we'll see what the rumors look like on the coaching front too. So hang on to your hats. Yes, and hang on to uh, the person's hat next to you as well. Columbus, by the way, for those that uh, might have forgotten, goalless draw against Nashville. Uh, midweek so that was their midweek result as they head on the road so yeah trying to steal a point uh, on the road sounds like a familiar theme to this particular show and because of that particular theme and the circular nature of how things are we're going to end it right there thanks to everybody who has contributed on the timeline to uh, salty takeaways obviously uh, sdh is going to be sdh pm on thursday back to a normal sdh am on your friday and we'll have salty takeaways and hopefully not a as many bitter ends as folks did with Luciano Macosta with Columbus coming to town on Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening. So uh, for me, John, Jarrett, send us home. Much applause to y'all.